Good day, students. Welcome to part one of Rise of the Nazis, Nationalism and Unification, 1815 to 1871. This short series is designed to help students uh, understand the historical context, maybe get some strong content knowledge regarding unification of Germany in the 19th century, which set the stage for German aggression uh, in World War I, which then, of course, led to the rise of the Nazis, 1919 to 1933. This series is designed to help students with uh, paper one, the move to global war, prescribed subject three, German expansion, 1933 to 1940. It should also help students with uh, paper two questions, topic 10, authoritarian states, and topic 11, the causes and effects of war, that's 20th century war. Possibly could help with paper three also. Uh, topic 14, European states in the interwar years, 1918 to 1939. And topic 15, diplomacy in Europe, 1919 to 1945, where sometimes you see questions about Nazi ideology uh, or appeasement. They like to ask the appeasement question uh, during, that, during that time period, which will be covered later. 19th century, three, I think, big impacts on German nationalism and the rise uh, of unification, uh, the quest for German national identity. First, Napoleon's impact, the impact of the Napoleonic Wars on European nationalism, but especially on German nationalism. Number two, the revolutions of 1848, which began in France, in Paris, in February and spread to other parts of Europe in March and April of that springtime, springtime of the peoples, as it was called. And the rise, number three, the rise of Otto von Bismarck, the German chancellor, the iron chancellor, blood and iron, Otto von Bismarck, who provoked three wars, sometimes referred to as the wars of unification, the third being the Franco-Prussian War, which eventually led to the unification of Germany in 1871. But even Napoleon's impact, the Corsican, the renegade, the rogue Corsican, head of the Grand Armée, gallivanting around Europe, stirring up trouble, stirring up nationalism. Before that time, Germany was not a country. German speakers were scattered throughout Central Europe, and there was very little idea, a very little sense of common national identity amongst the speakers who were spread out during, uh, through excuse me, numer numerous states. In 1806, when Napoleon dismantled or dissolved the Holy Roman Empire, the German Confederation of the Rhine was established. The very beginnings of uh, something that we may eventually call a unified German state, but just the very, very beginnings, about 16 German states in the Confederation of the Rhine. The wars that Napoleon waged uh, stirred, inspired, incited a lot of nationalist feeling throughout Central Europe, but especially amongst the German-speaking peoples of the, uh, the Austrian Empire and the lands that are now unified Germany. At this time, German princes harnessed a lot of that nationalist sentiment in order to eventually boot Napoleon out of German-speaking lands for good in 1813 at the Battle of Leipzig. In short, the response to Napoleon was one of rising nationalism and the beginnings of a desire to forge a common German identity. Congress Vienna in 1815, when the powers that be in Europe came together to reestablish, restore order in Europe, a confederation called the German Confederation of 39 German-speaking states was established. Again, another step on the way to eventual German unification. An economic step, interestingly, in 1833, the Zollverein, which was a German custom union, was established and Prussia took the lead. Remember that name Prussia, it's Northeastern Germany. The capital is Berlin 
And this economic union is led by Prussia. Sometimes we refer to Prussia as Russia with a P. Number two, the revolutions of 1848. France sneezes and Europe catches a cold, as Metternich fam famously said about the first revolution in 1789, which caused so much trouble for the monarchs uh, in Europe. By 1848, the monarch of France is the citizen king. Uh, his name is Louis Philippe, the citizen king. So he's king, but maybe in the French fashion, fashion uh, not so authoritarian. Remember, we had the revolutions of 1789 in France, the revolutions of 1830. And now in 1848, the French are again taken to the streets, building barricades and stirring up trouble. This is in February. It spreads to the German-speaking lands of Central Europe by March uh, and April, where German protesters and revolutionaries put up the call now for a German constitution, a unified Germany, under the lead or the head of Frederick Wilhelm IV of Prussia. German efforts fail, as do the majority of revolutionary efforts in Europe at that time in 1848 for a number of reasons, including lack of centralized leadership, lack of communication uh, amongst revolutionary groups, uh, this is a failure for the revolutions of 1848, and German unification is again put on hold. The third big impact of the 19th century leading to German unification is the rise of the Prussian Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, sometimes called the Iron Chancellor for emphasizing the strength of blood and iron uh, in Prussia. He is going to provoke three wars, sometimes referred to as wars of unification, one against Denmark, one against Austria, and finally one against Germany's arch nemesis, arch enemy, France, the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-1871, which, which conclusion is going to see the establishment of a unified Germany and a German empire. Bismarck has three or four main goals. One of the main goals is to unify the German states under Prussia control, not under Austrian control, so that Prussia will be the center of the German-speaking world. Berlin, rather than Vienna, will be the center of the German-speaking world. He also wants to strengthen the role of the king of Prussia at this time, Kaiser Wilhelm the first, and unify Germany under that Kaiser. The wars are fought. The wars are won. The Franco-Prussian War, a very interesting war, a very important war, which will loom large again in 1914, and then especially in 1918, when we see France extract uh, astronomical reparations, from the, from the Germans after World War I in retaliation for uh, what the Germans did to the French in 1871, the punishments the Germans laid on the French. More about that later. The great British statesman, Benjamin Disraeli, in 1871, shortly after the unification of Germany, Disraeli, who had been prime minister and will be prime minister again later in the 1870s, had this stark warning, what the German unification would mean for Europe and the world. He said the following, this war represents German, the German revolution, a greater political event, he says, than the French revolution of the last century. The balance of power has been entirely destroyed. And the country which suffers most, this really says, and feels the effects of this great change the most, he notes, is England. Why that is the case will be the topic of the next part in the series when we look at the rising rivalry between Germany and England, especially on the high seas. If you found this video useful, please do hit the subscribe and like button and stay tuned for part two in the series, The Rise of the Nazis.